Welcome to a new episode of Books and Beyond from the Winter Park Library, recorded live in the recording studio at the library in beautiful Winter Park, Florida. In Books and Beyond, we have conversations with writers, musicians, artists, presenters, and other contributors. Most of our guests have appeared live at the Winter Park Library or will be presenting soon. We hope you'll subscribe to the Books and Beyond podcast and that you'll stay up to date with library goings-on at winterparklibrary.org slash events. That's winterparklibrary.org slash events. I'm Michael Werner, and I'll be your host for our interviews. Enjoy the show. Hello out there, library patrons, readers, and smart people everywhere. Michael Werner, your host here, and we're happy to be back with you in the beautiful Winter Park Library in the recording studio. And just, which reminds me before we bring our guest on, uh, the recording studio is available to anybody who is a member of the library or wants to stop by. You do need to stop and take a short introductory session, uh, an overview, which is actually taught by or hosted by Jeremy Zorn, who is actually the producer of this podcast. So if you come and, and meet Jeremy and spend a little time here in this in the recording studio, then you're free to use it for recording music, uh, podcast, uh, spoken word, books, ebooks, whatever, what or not ebooks, uh, audio books, whatever you want to do. Uh, so it's open to you, as is so much more here in the library. If you go to winterparklibrary.org slash events, you're going to see every month over 100 kinds of things going on here at the library, everything from talks, presentations, thanks for kids, thanks for seniors. Uh, our guest today, who is Eric Deckers, who I'll be introducing formally in just a second, he hosts a group here, uh, I believe it's monthly, uh, called uh, the Orlando Word Lab, and we'll talk about that a, a bit later. So he's one of the 100 or so events that happens here every month, so please check it out. WinterParkLibrary.org slash events. Okay, I mentioned Eric Deckers is our is our guest today. Eric uh, was doing some research on Eric, and I found just a lot of stuff this guy does. Uh, I think the, the single best way to describe him is he works with words. He's a writer. He's a uh, blogger. He's a uh, ghostwriter. He's recently written his first uh, book of fiction, uh, but I think he made his name writing uh, blog posts for himself and for other organizations, a lot of ghostwriting. Uh, what else has he done? Uh, humor columns that he's, he's he's done. We'll talk to him about that. He's, he's a writer. He's been a writer for several decades. And I'd like to... A few decades. A few decades. Yeah, a few <laughs> decades. And here he is, Eric Deckers. El- Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. G- glad to have you. We're in the secret basement of the uh, Winter Park Library. We're in the secret basement. Yeah, you got to you gotta kind of know the password to get down exactly. here. Exactly. But, but so, once, you, once you find it, you'll, you'll, you'll want to come back. Okay, let's let's talk about your life as a writer, Eric. What, what, when did this sort of fall into place for you? I mean, you just woke up one morning and said, hey, I want to be a writer. <clears throat> well, I, I didn't know I wanted to be a writer right away, but it, it started for me back when I was 16, and I was, uh, as we were talking before uh, we started, I, I grew up in Muncie, Indiana, and I was walking on Ball State's campus, and the bookstore had a banned books poster up, not condoning it, but rather, you know, saying we are against banned books. Here's here is a list of the books that have been banned. And I looked at a few books on that list, like Catch-22 and Slaughterhouse-Five. And to me, the list said, these are books that we don't want Eric to read. <laughs> well, anybody who knows me knows that the best way to get me to do something is to tell me not to do it. And so when there is a list of books I'm not supposed to read, the first thing I want to do is go read those books. And so I read Catch-22, I read Slaughterhouse-Five, I also read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, After seeing the poster? Uh, th- right. That one was not on the poster, but I kind of encountered it at about the same time. And those three books made me realize what satire is, and that it's a, you know, it's a way to speak truth to power, it's a way to be disruptive. And I thought, <clears throat> I want to do this, and I want to I speak that truth to power, I want to swear in books. And, uh, and so that sort of planted the seed, but I never thought about how do I go about doing it. I just started writing because I enjoyed it, and I, I found I was good at it. You know, in high school and in college, I could write. Uh, I always got A's on papers. I started working for the, the Ball State Daily News, and throughout my, uh, my burgeoning career, writing was always a part of that, and I... I became a newspaper humor columnist uh, when I was about 28 and, um, and finally realized 
three years after that, you know, when I was in my third, you know, like 30, 31, I realized, oh, I'm a writer. And so it just sort of accidentally happened. And I realized this was a thing I did. And this, this was sort of who I was now. And so I started looking for more opportunities to write books, to write stage plays and radio plays and marketing material. And so my day job is actually as a ghost blogger. Uh, I ghost write blog articles for companies and I ghost write books for people. And so it's only been in the last 15 years that I've had my own business and I've been very intentional about doing it. All the, all the time before that was just, it's part of what I do, uh, but I did a lot of other things as well. Now it's only what I do. Mm-hmm. And are you still doing the, hum- the, the humor columns? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm closing in on 29 years wow. uh, with the same seven newspapers in Indiana. Uh, I, I send them. In fact, today we're recording this on Thursday. Tonight is column night. I write my newspaper column every Thursday night and send it off around midnight. And I've always done it that way. My family knows that we don't do anything on Thursday nights because Eric has his column. Right. And do you do you syndicate them yourselves, or do you have a syndication yes, it's you self syndicated. Self syndicated. Okay. Which means you find the individual newspapers and correct. You, you contract with them in, in, independently. Correct. Have you? I'm just curious. Have you looked at syndication at all? Um, early, uh, early on when I first looked at that as an option, I contacted a few, the few syndications that were out there. And I got a no from all of them. And then I found an article that talked about self-syndication. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of the true Indiana spirit is, yeah. is we do it ourselves. And I thought, well, if these guys aren't going to help me, then I'm just going to go do it. And I found a few papers and just kind of stopped and lost interest and wandered off and did something else. Right, so. right, right, right. And in the blogging that you do, uh, the guest blogging, how do you how do you <coughs> find your customers for that? So that's usually a, a matter of word of mouth or somebody finds my website, or I give a presentation on writing or on content marketing and uh, at a business conference and somebody sees that and asks me uh, to write for them, they figure, well, if you know so much about it that you can present about it, you must be good at it. So you're going to be better at it than we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've been doing that as long as you've been doing the humor columns? Uh, No, I've been doing that for about 15 years. Okay, okay. And I think you know a lot of listeners, a lot of a lot of people that come to the library, they they are writers or want to. A lot of people are want to be writers. You know, they have a dream. You know mm-hmm. this. That you you meet them in your in your daily life. Sure. I'm sure. Uh, people that want to write, want to get published, want to uh, want to spread their information or their their beliefs via uh, written publications. Uh, what is your advice to want to be writers? Just start doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> if you need a place to publish, go to a place like WordPress.com. It's free. Uh, or go to Blogger.com, which is also free. It's owned by Google. Just set up a basic blog and then start publishing your ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, pick a, be very specific and and uh, detail oriented in the thing that you want to write about. Uh, not only your subject, but your article. Your goal is not to write a book in a day. Your goal is to do about a thousand words on a particular topic in a day, and you just write it, and then you publish it, and then you share it with people, and then you do it again uh, the next time you feel the urge to come in. And eventually, when you do enough of these, you've got the beginnings of a book. And Eric, is that how your books, your, your at least your first couple of your nonfiction books, have evolved <clears throat> out of blog posts? Uh, they didn't evolve that way, but my co-authors and I wrote them that way. We. We both had strong blogging uh, backgrounds, like um, Kyle Lacey, who I wrote Branding Yourself with, and I helped him write Twitter Marketing for Dummies back in 2009. We both had strong blogging backgrounds, and so when we organized the book, we broke it up into the chapters and the sub-chapters and the sub-sub-chapters, and when we got down to that level, that's when we said, this is a blog post. Treat it like a blog post. You know, So we weren't focusing on writing a chapter. We were focusing on writing a series of blog posts. Okay, uh, very interesting. Uh, so what what took you? So you at some point you moved away from that, or you stopped writing books, a lot nonfiction books, uh, and you started doing more ghostwriting. I think, right? Yes. Uh, how do you find that? Um, again, that's word of mouth yeah. uh, in a lot of cases. Or I've started, um, I've started giving presentations uh, to groups of people about here's why you need a memoir. 
mm-hmm. or here's why you need a business book. And, you know, it, it all boils down to personal branding. Or for the memoir, it's people that want to leave a legacy for the, for the generations that come after them. And they, don't, they realize they don't know how to write it or they don't have the time. Mm-hmm. Same thing with the business books. And so they just dictate to me what they want to say. And we meet every two weeks until we get through the list of chapters. And I turn that into a book for them. Do you do you have them? Rec- you, do you work from recordings of things that they've left, or you have questionnaires for them? How, how does that work? Uh, we just do interviews. Okay. And so you know, we would have an initial kickoff conversation of what do you want to talk about? Uh, what are the ideas you want to get across? Who are you talking to? Um, and I come up with an outline. And typically, a, a good sized business book is going to be around forty five thousand words. It's going to be about twelve or thirteen chapters. And we come up with the outline. And then when I interview the client, we talk about every two weeks. And they get through one or two chapters. And we just keep going until we're done. And then I go away and write everything that they dictated. Yeah, I, I saw somewhere, I don't know, it was, it was years ago. I think I got the quote. I, I'm going to have the quote wrong here. But I saw somebody said uh, a book that you have written or the, that has been ghostwritten for you with your name on it is the best $30 calling card you can have. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I think that's that's probably true. Is that, that A lot of people probably do it for that reason. Yes. A lot of business people. A lot of business people because uh, it's, it's what we call social proof. Right. This proves you know what you're talking about. You have a book. You must, you know, you've filled up 45, 60,000 words with your knowledge. You must have a whole lot more in the can and so you send that book to conference organizers uh, or, or you know, HR people at businesses that need training. And you say, look, I know a lot about this. And so they have you come in. And so I always tell people, you never make money from your book. You make money because of your book. Yeah. You're not going to sell enough copies of your book to make $60,000. But you could get uh, $10,000, $6,000 training sessions as a result of it. And you can do that every year. Your book sales, if you manage to get $60,000 in a year, it's going to drop the next year and every year after. Sure, sure. And then you have to write another book. But there are people who write one great business book and then they just make bank on that for years to come. I saw uh, a well-known author. I don't, okay, his name is, is eluding me at the moment. It'll come to me to, tonight at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> said something like, as he, he gave a statistic. He said, it's easier to become a billionaire than a successful full-time book author. Yes. Uh, there are more billionaires than there are people that make a living from writing books. And I found that to be an amazing statistic. Yeah. Although that number is is kind of growing if you if you look at the fiction market. Uh-huh. Um, and if you if you understand pulp fiction books, you know the old pulp books from the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know those little pocket paperback books. Yeah, yeah. And people like Mickey Splain and Dashiell Hammett would would just with dash the damsel on the front. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they would just write one of those once per month, and they were formulaic, and they always followed the same steps, and they had the same characters and the same archetypes, and they just wrote a new one every month. And they might get paid, you know, seven hundred and fifty dollars to write a book, but you know that's, you know, in the forties a refrigerator was like a hundred dollars, mm-hmm. so you got the price of seven refrigerators. So they would just do this every month. Take that same idea, and we have people now who are in the ebook market, and they are writing these small fifteen, twenty thousand word novels, or they'll do it maybe quarterly. And they'll do a full 60,000-word novel. That's about the size of an average novel. Yeah. And they do that every quarter. And then they, they spend all the rest of their time marketing the book. And, and that's something book authors should do anyway. And so I always say uh, you spend 90% of your time writing your book. You spend the other 90% of your time <laughs> marketing the book. Yeah. And so that's what these pulp authors do. They, they write and they market. And so there are groups on Facebook dedicated to teaching you how to market your book. They don't care what you write. This is all about how you get right. sales and get uh, just get units sold. And so things like write an eight-book series and give the first book away for free, uh, release your books one at a time, and then sell a whole set of that. And, right. and so there are people who are making over $100,000 a year doing that. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a faucet they can never turn off. Um, you know, the books will sell for a little while after, but if they shut off the marketing machine, 
the sales quickly dry up. And so they have to write another book and they have to keep marketing. And it's a, it's a, it's a, not a self-perpetuating machine, but it's, it's a beast that needs to be fed constantly. Well, I think it, 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 it points to the fact that I think most beginning authors, in, in my experience anyway, bo- most beginning authors think that they write the book and if, they have a, if they're fortunate enough to have, or if they want to have a, a traditional print publisher, they turn the book in, and they're done. Mm-hmm. They, they go on to the next one. And you know that that's not true. You're exactly. The, you're the major, unless you're uh, you know, a major author, unless you're James Patterson or something. Exactly. You're going to be marketing your book. Yes. And a lot of people are surprised to learn that, what, the publisher's not going to do this for me, and people aren't just going to come buy it because I told them. Right. You know, I've got, I've got family members who have not read my novel. So I can't just put it out on Facebook and expect all my friends to buy it. You know, very few of my friends uh, bought the book, which really makes me think I need new friends. But <laughs> but they just don't because you think about all your friends that have all these things that they are doing. And are you supporting all those things? So right. why should they buy your book? And right. so, so it really does take a lot of effort. And I've talked to a lot of authors who are just floored by that. Like, oh, I have to promote my book? And, and they don't like this idea, and they expect their publisher to do it. But when you consider just in the public, traditionally published book market alone, there are about a million books per year published. Bookstores can't carry them. Yeah, yeah, a million. Four million when you get into the self-published world. But a million books published per year, when do they have time to, to promote all those? Right, right. Not all the bookstores are going to carry all those. How do you get... Barnes & Noble to pick your book up. They're not going to. <clears throat> the latest edition of my Branding Yourself book, when it came out in 2017, never got into Barnes & Noble because the publisher, uh, which was a Pearson imprint, stopped working with Barnes & Noble. They weren't getting any any great traction from Barnes & Noble, so they said, we're out of that book distribution model. So it all falls to you, the author, Ninety percent of the time, you're marketing your book. Yeah. Oh my goodness! What does that mean, Eric? That means it's time to play rapid fire Q and A. This okay. is a chance for us to get to know you as a person a little bit differently or a little better. Uh, so I'm going to give you some questions. Are there hey, prizes? There might be prizes. Oh, cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what you say. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a chance for you to, to give some short answers, uh, sentence or two about each one, and we'll, we'll go through them quickly. Uh, Eric, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Private investigator. Private investigator. Did you ever? Did you ever even come close to doing anything? Not, like that? N- not beyond high school. Although writing, writing, writing nonfiction books can be private investigation. Yes. Some, especially some of the the, the ghost writing, I would guess. Yes, and if I wanted to be an investigative journalist. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give your twenty year old self if you could go back? Pay more attention to what you were writing. Okay. What's your favorite city in the world? Indianapolis. Indianapolis, Indiana. We both know it well. Uh, what's something they don't teach you in school but should? I think being creative, how to be properly creative. How do you brainstorm ideas to solve a problem? Okay. Yeah, interesting. Uh What's a character trait you admire in others? Honesty. Who's your favorite fiction author? Oh, I don't have just one. Okay, who's who are some? some uh, Kurt of, Vonnegut, yeah. who's also from Indianapolis. Yes. Uh, Christopher Fowler, a British mystery writer who passed away last year. Christopher Moore, a San Francisco humor writer who did not. Uh, Douglas Adams, the author of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. Those are my top four. Okay. Uh, who's your f- uh, well we talked about your favorite fiction author how about nonfiction? Joe Poznanski P-O-S-N-A-N-S-K-I he's a sports writer yeah, and he is name. such a, a wordsmith I I just get crazy jealous when I read his stuff it's so good yeah he he once wrote a a column about the coach of the Washington Generals which is the basketball team that the Harlem Globetrotters right. play they their record is something like one in fifteen hundred, and oh, he, they actually won one. Yeah, <laughs> and he wrote about the the game uh, that that they won, but also just the coach in general, 
And uh, it was so amazing and so interesting that I, I became sorry that I had never paid attention to the Globetrotters and the generals to understand this coach because the writing was so good from Joe Posnanski. Is, is he still living and writing? He is. Yeah. Uh, if it had zero calories, what could you eat every day? Pizza. Or pizza. What, what do you like? What kind of pizza? Pepperoni, sausage, extra cheese. Well, now, knowing you're from Muncie, Indiana, and I, for the, I don't think I've mentioned it before, but I'm also from Muncie. It was a big coincidence that we found that we have here with uh, myself and, and, and Eric. Uh, pizza Hut? I'm, I'm sorry, Pizza King? And Greeks. P- pizza King and Greeks, yeah. Those pizza are- King. Uh, there, you, you would be interested in knowing there is a Sir Pizza down in Fort Myers. Right, I've heard uh, this. And that's a, that is a outside Indiana Pizza King franchise. Yeah, have you tried it? I have. It wasn't as good as the, uh, the original, but, you know, Pizza King, uh, the one on Tillotson had decades of experience, and these guys were like a few years old. Eric, I've spent many, many hours in the Pizza, pizza same, King on Tillotson. Same. Uh, let's see here. A couple more questions, and then we'll get back to uh, the other stuff. Uh, if you hadn't followed... And maybe I already know the answer to this, but if you hadn't followed your writing career path, what, what do you think you would have done? Or what would you like to have done? I would be a, a student affairs administrator at a university. Okay. That's actually what I have my degree in. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite saying or quote? No, only because there are so many. Okay. And how about a favorite movie? Oh, wait. I will okay. back up. Right, yeah. um, Douglas Adams used to say about deadlines – I love having deadlines. I love the whooshing sound they make because they fly by. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, again, there are a few. Uh, uh, the Pink Panther, The Return of the Pink Panther with Peter Sellers, not yeah. Steve Martin. Uh, Monty Python's Holy Grail and Young Frankenstein. Okay, thank you. Thanks for playing. Eric. Sure, thank and you. We'll, we'll, we'll go back to real life here now. Uh, so, writing career, uh, you've recently have, have, have jumped into fiction writing. You have a novel out. Yes. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about, about that and why you, why you ventured into that realm. So, I, I'd always had the novel kind of rattling around in my head, and uh, writing the first chapter of that actually got me uh, the spring 2016 residency at the Kerouac House here in Orlando. Uh, and I finally finished that uh, and published it in 2019. I self-published it. And then last year, uh, a, a small upstart publisher called Four Horsemen uh, republished it. Uh, and then I just recently submitted my second novel to them uh, th- early in the year. But Mackinac Island Nation, and it's spelled Mackinac, but it's pronounced Mackinac because it's French. Uh, the idea is that Mackinac Island... Uh, Michigan has been forced to secede from the United States because of a 200-year-old peace treaty, and it's going to take Congress two years to repatriate. And so the novel is about what happens in those two years. Okay. So you've obviously had some success with it since you since a, a traditional publisher picked it up. Yep. And it is a humor novel. It's satire. Okay. And I get to swear in it. Uh, okay. You, you like both of those things. Yep. And your next two are, are related to that in some way, or are they— uh, take The different- next one— is it takes place in the same universe, and I have some very minor characters from the first book who make an appearance in the second book. But this one takes place roughly 40 years, 50 years in the future. Uh, Again, satire. Half the world has died because there was another pandemic, uh, and the way it got politicized this time, uh, it happened again immediately, but nobody realized when they started that this was a, a virus with a 99% uh, mortality rate. So everybody died. Yeah. yeah. Um, the book starts 10 years after that. And the idea is that now all the liberals get their utopia, which they've always wanted, but they screw it all up. And because there is— Their utopia and in in, in, how does that come about or what? why? Uh, well, no military, okay. No military spending because there's no need. Okay. Uh, lots of arts spending, and they they give away money to artists uh, and equipment to artists, even though the artists don't want it. They're like so oversaturated with all this stuff that they that they have. Um, alternative energy is the main and only source of fuel, and 
Uh, and as a result, the people in power, at least on this local level, because it takes place in a, in a fictitious town called Appleseed, Ohio, uh, they become corrupt uh, because they, they don't have anybody overseeing them. They don't have anybody investigating them. And so I keep cracking my knuckles. I'm yeah, sorry. No, no, no worries. <laughs> but um, uh, we love sound effects here in the yep. studio. And so uh, the, the story is what happens when when they get the power they want that either they shouldn't have had or they aren't being opposed by the people who should have been there. And so uh, the story is actually about some young college students who they decide they are going to rebel. And the only way they know how to rebel is to become conservatives. <laughs> and okay. so they find uh, one of the few remaining moderates in in the university in Appleseed College where they all go to school and because he's a moderate he's the farthest right person in town now and so he teaches them how to be conservatives and this is so they can rebel against authority and sort of what happened in the 60s they're going to redo this in the uh 2050s okay okay and so you mentioned you got started uh because you had a residency at the at the Kerouac house tell tell us about Jack Kerouac, for those of us who don't know much about him, okay. or anything about the Kerouac House here in Orlando. Sure. So Jack Kerouac wrote On the Road. Uh, that's That novel sort of launched the beat generation in the 50s, and it launched, a, you know, it became the sort of defining voice of the generation. And Jack lived in a house uh, in College Park when that came out. And so uh, he actually had to borrow money from his girlfriend to go up to New York for the release uh, so he could ride the bus. Was, was it his mom's house? I'm trying to remember. Was it, was his mom lived with him. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, whenever he moved, he took his mom with her, with him. Um, so then when he came back, he uh, then wrote uh, The Dharma Bums in that house. And so he bounced around uh, between New York and California and Florida and I think Mexico and, and Tangiers. Uh, he even came back to Orlando, and there's a, another house a few miles from the Kerouac house where he wrote his book, Big Sur. Um, and so we bought the house, the Kerouac Project bought the house in 98 or 99 after Bob Keeling, who's a, a former TV news uh, person, uh, was writing a book about Jack's time in Florida, and he found out that Jack lived in College Park, called the Kerouac Estate, found out where it was. When he just found the house, it was in rough shape. It was, He says it was like weeks away from being condemned. And so he gathered a group of people. They all chipped in money. They bought the house, started the Kerouac Project, and turned it into a writer's residency. And we had our first resident in fall of 2000. So we are going into our 25th year of residencies wow, this okay. September. Uh, like I said, I was the spring 2016 member, uh, re writer in residence, and then joined the board that summer, and I'm now the president of the board. And how does that work as a writer? I mean, you're a resident. What does that mean? You, you just go and sh shut yourself in a room and write? <laughs> uh, you all, you shut yourself in the entire house. The you entire get the house. whole house to yourself. It's okay. about an 800-square-foot arts and crafts bungalow. Okay. And so you get the whole house to yourself. We cover the rent. We provide a food stipend. And you get to work uninterrupted on whatever it is you want. And so we have, uh, we have novelists, we have poets, we have creative nonfiction writers. Um, we we have not had any screenplay writers or stage play writers, uh, but we encourage them to apply. We just one has never been selected. So it's it's generally. Uh, fiction writers, nonfiction writers, and poets. And how are people selected? Is there a, a board? Or a There's a, a, a committee that committee. reads all the submissions, and they pick the best writers. And so we're not really looking for up-and-coming writers, you know, the person who just graduated from an MFA program. That's not really who we're looking for, but we're not looking for, uh, you know, that, that James Patterson type who, you know, could buy his own house to do his work in, which he probably has eight of. Right, right. Um, but we want somebody who's sort of mid-career. Um, they're they're making their name. They're they're becoming known, and we want to be sort of that that place for them to hole up and do their best work. Okay, and you're the director there now, currently. Yes. And what what is your role there? So the I'm the I'm the president. President. Okay. And uh, so I I work with the board, and we just 
work on things like selecting the new riders, uh, keeping the house up and running. We're getting ready to launch a capital campaign pretty soon because we need to refurbish the house and, and uh, do a restoration initiative. Uh, and so we're going to be launching that. And so as the president, I'm going to be sort of leading the charge in that. Okay. And you do two two writers a year? Is that what it is? Six months? Six, uh, six a year. Six a year. Two, uh, one per every two months. Okay. It used to be four a year, and you got three months. And we have applicants from all over the world, uh, about 300 to 400 applicants. And we've had people from uh, Singapore, New Zealand, Ireland, and all over the U.S. and any number of fields, any any different background, just people from all over uh, and all walks of life. Wonderful. Sounds like a sounds like a worthy uh, organization to be involved with. It is. Yeah. Sounds sounds fantastic. Uh, a couple of other things I want to I want to definitely get into the what what goes on here at the Winter Park Library because that's where we are at the Winter Park Library. Mm-hmm. But before we do that, tell me, you're involved with another organization called One Million Cups. Uh, one Million Cups. It is. Uh, if you want to go to the website, it's number one numeral one okay. million cups dot com, and that has an entrepreneurial networking organization. We meet every Wednesday morning at 8.30, and it's just a chance for entrepreneurs to come together, meet one another. Uh, you build relationships, and you, you build your network. And then when you need help with something, uh, these are the people you go to. When you need referrals to somebody, these are the people who can make those connections. And I always tell people, if you attend a meeting, you are not there to meet your client. You are there to meet the people who know your client. You know, and, and hopefully the person you meet knows a lot of your clients. Right. And, and when you say, I need to meet marketing directors in manufacturing companies, there's going to be somebody there who knows several marketing directors in manufacturing companies, and they can make introductions between you and those those different marketing directors. And why are those people there? Why are the, 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 the I'll call them the money people? There's, there's money people there, and then there's people looking for money for their business or mm-hmm. their organization. The, well, there, there are a lot of startups. Uh, we focus primarily on technology and tech companies. And Orlando was uh, named, I think, for the second or third year in a row, uh, the top city to start a business in by Wallet Hub. Okay. And so we have we have a very vibrant startup community here in Orlando. A lot of people think we're just entertainment, but when you look at um, sort of the simulation and training industry, Orlando is is ground zero. We have hundreds of companies that that work with the military or with uh, and you know, uh, games and entertainment, or with theme parks, and all different kinds of companies are starting up all different kinds of things just in that industry. But when you look at software and applications and web design and marketing agencies and small manufacturers, Orlando really is the number one city. And out of the top four, uh, you also have uh, Tampa, St. Pete, and Miami. Wow. Okay. So Florida really is a great place to start a company. And so these a lot of these people who are doing their startups come to organizations like One Million Cups because they are looking for other people. They're looking for investors or they are looking for, again, the people who know their customers or they're looking for help with marketing or with logistics or with finance or they need an HR specialist. And so One Million Cups is just a, a great place to come and, and build relationships with other people building companies. And your background as a writer, what was it that drew you to this? This is more businessy mm-hmm. than, than writing. What, what, what drew you to that? Uh, I own my own business. Okay. I own a content marketing agency. And so okay. for all intents and purposes, I am a business owner who writes, but I think of myself as a writer who owns a business. But uh, I've been involved with entrepreneurship and, uh, and networking for well over 18, 20 years, because being a professional marketer before this, I was always out meeting new people, meeting new companies, uh, always looking to build relationships and to, to help people find the ones that they need. So I've been doing that as part of my career. And it just so happened when I became a business owner, then I really got to feed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, mm-hmm. you know, I love doing that. And so being a business owner gave me an excuse to do it. And how long have you been involved with them? One million cups. Uh, I would say it's been about six years. Okay. Okay. And I was in charge of that organization for three years. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's talk about another uh, organization you, that you lead, the, the one that, that meets here in the uh, Winter Park Library, and it's called, uh, what's it called? The group is called Writers of Central Florida, or okay. Thereabouts, Okay. and uh, I refer to myself as an adult in charge, Okay. Uh, and we, we have two events. Uh, we have one here, and that's Orlando Word Lab, and that is just a writing workshop uh, that we do every fourth Wednesday of the month. Ex- and, and again, people can find it if they go to winterparklibrary.org slash events. It'll show up in there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's also on Meetup, or you can find Writers of Central Florida or thereabouts on Facebook. And uh, we have different topics each month. We don't meet in November, December. But uh, this month in July, uh, a woman named Jamie Engel is going to be teaching us on how to write into great detail and background information in your stories. Uh, as a way to sort of help you generate new ideas and, and uh, help push your story along. She is a screenwriter and a, uh, a script doctor from out in Melbourne, Florida, not Australia. Yeah. Uh, and she's actually driving out here next week to teach us how to do that. Uh, in August, Ken Pelham, uh, who uh, used to run the Florida Writers Association group up in Maitland, He's coming, and I can't remember the, the topic he's doing, but, uh, you know, we're looking at people for September and October and, and filling up the entire year. I will, uh, once in a while, I'll do something on dialogue writing or humor writing. Uh, we've got a guy who every about every year and a half he will uh, teach us on how to write believable and fun villains. Okay, um, that, that would be fun. And other people on how to flesh out your book, how to write a romance story, how to how to write a screenplay. Uh, and so we have just any number of uh, topics. And if somebody's got a request and we've got the space, we'll, we'll either pick the person or pick the topic and find the person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do any number of things. And then we also do on the second Wednesday of every month at Stardust Video and Coffee, uh, we have the short attention span storytelling uh, and it's an open mic where you come and read for about six to eight minutes of your work, of your own work, uh, whether it's a completed project or whether it's the first draft and you're looking for feedback. But it's a room full of writers who are all there for the same thing. So nobody's going to be nervous because they are going to be doing what you are going to be doing. And so if you think somebody's going to make fun of you, you get to make fun of them. But that never happens. It's a very supportive uh room and very supportive organization uh, but it's just a chance to meet other writers and find out what everybody else is working on mm-hmm. and so I always remind people it's Stardust Video and Coffee not the Stardust nightclub in downtown Orlando so if you're having a good time you're in the wrong place <laughs> although being being around writers could be a good time yes, too. Yes. yeah 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 uh, so uh, what kind of people come to those sessions here at the library or the, the other events that you do it, with writers it really varies. We have a, a big mix. I mean, everybody's got a story to tell, uh, and only a few people actually try to do that. Uh, so we've got writers of all ages and skill levels uh, and, and interest. We have some people who do dark fantasy. We have some people who do poetry. We have some people who do creative nonfiction. We have script writers and screenwriters. We have really just about any genre, any platform you can think of. Lately, we've been having a guy who is getting his Ph.D. in cybersecurity, uh, and he will read one of his academic papers to us. And okay. so yeah, that's yeah, that's a yeah. first for us. Yeah, we've never yeah, had yeah. an academic come right, and read right. their academic work. Right. But this is the place for that. This is the group for that. If so, you're right, this is, you can come. Yeah, if yeah. you string words together in sentences for people to read and enjoy, then this is the place for you. Okay. Uh, Eric, before we wrap up, and we're, we're just about done, uh, how do we get in touch with you? Or if, anybody, if anybody here listening wants to get in touch with you, you have a website? Uh, what's the I best do. place to find you? Uh, so Eric is spelled E-R-I-K. Okay. Deckers is D-E-C-K-E-R-S. Yeah. And so I, I have, my website is ericdeckers.com. I'm on Twitter at edeckers. Uh, and then my email is just eric.deckers at gmail.com. Okay. So if we remember Eric Deckers, we're going to remember how to get in touch with you. Exactly. So, so, somewhere. And just good. Google me. There are only six Eric Deckers in the world. Okay. Uh, there's me, and there are five Belgians. <laughs> and they all Deckers share this. Deckers is a Bel- Belgian name? Yes. Yeah. And so I started a Facebook group called My Name is Eric Deckers, and there are exactly six of us in it. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, well, hey, thanks very much for 
coming today. Uh, wish you best of luck, and I wish that people listening, if, if you're interested, get in touch with Eric or come by the Winter Park Library and uh, participate in the, in the Orlando Word Lab. Yep. Thanks, thanks again, Eric. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Books and Beyond from the Winter Park Library. This podcast would not be possible without the generous help and support from the library staff, and especially from Jeremy Zorn. Jeremy's official title is Public Services Librarian, but he does many things here at the library, including producing this podcast. We can't do this without you, Jeremy. Our theme music is from the song Don't Go by Bovine Joe and the Buffalo Herd. That's Herd spelled H-E-A-R-D. We hope you'll let your friends and others know about this podcast and that you'll come by the library for one of our offerings, which you can find at winterparklibrary.org slash events. That's winterparklibrary.org slash events. If you have questions or suggestions for the podcast or just want to talk about books and beyond, please send an email to podcast at winterparklibrary.org. That's an email to podcast at winterparklibrary.org. Remember that the Winter Park Library promotes the free and open exchange of ideas and does not attempt to control or take responsibility for any opinions that may be expressed in this podcast. Opinions expressed in this podcast do not constitute or imply an endorsement or a reflection of the library's policies or beliefs. This is Michael Werner wishing you well until our next episode of Books and Beyond.